welcome to our audience here in Davos and to those of you also tuning in from around the world. If you're following us on social media, hashtag WEF22, please. We need as much audience participation and listening in and um, amplification, I think, of the message today. We're here to discuss averting a global food crisis. So I'm going to be a little bit controversial to begin. It's just day two of Davos, and I'm already convinced we are already in a global food crisis. Just consider some facts. Global food, land, and ocean systems represent industries worth $10 trillion. That's more than 12% of global GDP. It's also a staggering 40% of all jobs. And the cost to the climate of these industries is devastating. They're responsible for almost 80% of tropical deforestation and one third of global greenhouse emissions. All that effort and all that environmental cost, and yet we waste as much as a third of the world's food supply every year. That has to stop. Today, the heartbreaking tragedy of Russia's war in Ukraine is a wake-up call to a much wider war, a product of years of inefficient farming, regional conflict, climate change, and of course, the past two years of COVID. Today's soaring food and fertilizer prices and broken supply chains, as you'll hear, are being felt all over the world. Meanwhile, on Ukraine's farms, the literal seeds that could help allay this crisis are not being sown. They're not allowed to be sown. Let's be clear. The consequence, 49 million people now facing emergency levels of hunger. Over 800 million people going hungry each night. And remember, of course, China's food demand is down because of lockdown. This situation could get far worse very quickly. And while the alarm bells are ringing, and I think we're all hearing them, I'm not sure leaders understand how swiftly we need to act. Hungry societies break down wherever you are in the world. But there's hope, so we can take a breathe. I'm privileged to be joined by a panel of experts who not only understand the crippling cost burden of the food crisis, but they're also pioneering ways to tackle it. And better still, their plans could help buyers critical, vital time to address the other existential crisis we face, and that's the climate crisis. So let's get to it. First, may I introduce His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam, Le Minh Cai. Your Excellency, please. Yes. Uh, thưa uh, bà chủ tọa, thưa quý vị đại biểu, trước tiên thì tôi hết sức là vinh hạnh được uh, phát biểu khai mạc cái phiên uh, họp hết sức là quan trọng về chuyển hướng khủng hoảng lương thực toàn cầu ngày hôm nay. Uh, như quý vị đã biết uh, thì chúng ta đang ở trong cái giai đoạn là khủng hoảng trồng khủng hoảng từ cái tác động kép của đại dịch Covid-19 và cái uh, khủng hoảng chính trị ở một số nước đã tác động uh, chưa từng có đến nguồn cung lương thực, giá cả và cái chuỗi cung ứng toàn cầu về lương thực. Từ đó nó đã tác động không nhỏ đến cái đời sống của hơn 800 triệu người đang đối mặt với cái nạn thiếu lương thực. À, trước cái biến đổi khí hậu, chuyển đổi số, rồi cái tiêu dùng xanh và cái trách nhiệm của xã hội thì tạo ra một cái thách thức là đa cực đối với hệ thống lương thực toàn cầu. À, Việt Nam là một nước à, có cái à, thế mạnh về nông nghiệp. À, trong những năm trước thì à, chúng tôi cũng không tự cung được lương thực mà phải nhập khẩu. Nhưng trong thời gian gần đây thì chúng tôi đã trở thành một nước à, góp phần rất là quan trọng trong cái đảm bảo an ninh lương thực toàn cầu. À, trong cái à, buổi à, thảo luận ngày hôm nay, tôi xin à, đề xuất à, 5 cái nội dung. À, thứ nhất à, là vì... À, À, an ninh lương thực là nó tiếp cận tới toàn dân do đó là phải có một cái sự tiếp cận nó tổng thể à, đa chiều đa mục tiêu và không chỉ ngắn hạn mà phải dài hạn và hướng tới một cái mục tiêu à, hệ thống lương thực là phải tự cường bao trùm và bền vững à, về à, trước mắt thì chúng ta cũng phải là viện trợ nhân đạo cấp bách cho một số quốc gia hiện nay đang đối mặt với lại cái nạn thiếu lương thực và cũng phải là phục hồi 
cái hệ thống cung ứng lương thực toàn cầu và cũng phải chống cái rào cản các thương mại trong cái việc cung cấp lương thực về lâu dài thì chúng ta cũng phải chuyển cái hướng sản xuất nông nghiệp theo cái hướng là bền vững sạch à, giảm phát thải và gắn với chuyển đổi số và thân thiện với môi trường thứ hai là vì là đây là một cái việc mà có cái tầm toàn cầu do đó là chúng ta cũng phải tăng cường cái hợp tác quốc tế thể hiện cái vai trò rất tích cực của các cái tổ chức đa phương trong cái việc giải quyết những cái vấn đề về an ninh lương thực à, đối với những nước à, à, thì cần phải có một cái sự phối hợp giữa các cái cơ chế ba bên và phải thông qua cái hệ thống phải phải phục hồi một cái hệ thống à, à, cung ứng lương thực toàn cầu và phải à, à, gỡ bỏ những cái rào cản về à, thương mại à, lương thực về về, về 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 thương mại lương thực và phải xây dựng một cái nền tảng à, công nghệ số à, trên phạm vi là toàn cầu là xuyên quốc gia và phải là hỗ trợ tài chính cho các cái nước đang phát triển và ủng hộ cái cơ chế hợp tác ba bên ở Việt Nam thì như các ngài biết là thông qua các cái tổ chức tài chính đa phương Việt Nam đã cử các cái chuyên gia các cái nhà khoa học sang một số nước Châu Phi Châu Mỹ Latin để hỗ trợ tự lực tự cường để tự chủ cái an ninh lương thực tại chỗ cái thứ ba là về các cái giải pháp nó liên quan tới an ninh lương thực toàn cầu thì phải có cái sự tiếp cận uh, bao trùm toàn xã hội và đề cao cái uh, uh, trách nhiệm của, của của người dân thì phải xem cái người dân là cái trung tâm là mục tiêu của, của tất cả các cái giải pháp để mà thực hiện cái an ninh lương thực uh, trong đó là chúng ta cũng cần phải uh, chuyển đổi cái uh, hệ thống sản xuất nông nghiệp uh, theo cái hướng là bền, bền vững công bằng và tính đến cái lợi ích của các cái đối tượng mà bị ảnh hưởng và đặc biệt là các cái đối tượng bị yếu thế. Cái thứ tư là chúng ta cần phải chuyển cái hệ sinh thái nông nghiệp liên quan đến tất cả các cái bên cùng tham gia và cùng tham gia vào cái 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 chuỗi cung ứng toàn cầu. Ở Việt Nam thì chúng tôi cũng kiên trì là thực hiện cái mô hình là liên kết giữa bốn nhà là nhà nước, nhà doanh nghiệp, nhà khoa học và nhà nông để là đảm bảo tự cung lương thực để sản xuất nó bền vững và đồng thời là giải quyết hài hòa cái lợi ích và cái trách nhiệm của các bên để góp phần là đảm bảo an ninh lương thực cho quốc gia và cho toàn cầu. Cái thứ năm là cần phải tư duy một cách đổi mới là phải huy động tất cả các cái động lực để mà phát triển và thúc đẩy cái nền nông nghiệp theo cái hướng hiện đại và bền vững. Đó là chúng ta cũng phải là ứng dụng cái cuộc cách mạng công nghiệp lần thứ tư. thì trong đó là phải tập trung chuyển đổi số, tập trung ứng dụng công nghệ cao, phải xây dựng cái chuỗi giá trị nông nghiệp thông minh, bền vững và thích ứng với biến đổi. Đồng thời là cũng phải là xây dựng một cái hệ thống đổi mới sáng tạo để làm sao là chúng ta thực hiện một cái chuỗi cung ứng toàn cầu nó đạt hiệu quả. Và với cái trách nhiệm của Việt Nam là một cái nước à, có cái lợi thế về nông nghiệp và đồng thời chúng tôi cũng có cái lợi thế về chuyển đổi kinh tế số. Do đó chúng tôi là đề nghị là các nước cũng như là các cái tổ chức quốc tế và các cái doanh nghiệp của web là hỗ trợ và ủng hộ cho việc thành lập một cái trung tâm sáng tạo à, về à, hệ thống à, à, cung ứng cái à, lương thực và thực phẩm ở Đông Nam Á mà đặt ở tại Việt Nam. Thì thưa quý vị như các ngài biết, là Việt Nam cũng đang là theo đuổi một cái nền nông nghiệp sạch, à, thấp các à, sử dụng các bon thấp và đồng thời theo cái hướng là bền vững à, và hiện đại thì chúng tôi cũng thực hiện trên ba cái trụ cột thứ nhất là nông nghiệp thì phải à, sinh thái, nhà nông thì phải là thông minh và à, và và nông thôn thì phải hiện đại. À, tuy nhiên thì chúng tôi cũng bị rất là nhiều thách thức. À, đặc biệt là do cái tác động của biến đổi khí hậu và nước biển dân ở đồng bằng sông Cửu Long là một trong những cái uh, trung tâm mà sản xuất lương thực của quốc gia và của thế giới. Do đó là chúng tôi cũng uh, mong muốn và kêu gọi các cái tổ chức quốc tế, các nước và các cái nhà khoa học chung tay cùng Việt Nam uh, để mà có những cái giải pháp để mà ứng phó với biến đổi khí hậu để làm sao xây dựng một cái nền nông nghiệp 
bền vững đáp ứng được cái yêu cầu của Việt Nam và cho thế giới. Và xin trân trọng cảm ơn quý vị đại biểu và sau đây tôi xin lắng nghe ý kiến của các vị. Your Excellency, thank you so much. You need to understand your destination to plot a course there. And I loved your point about needing a short-term plan of action here and a longer-term plan. And we're going to talk about both on the panel today. Let me introduce our panelists. His Excellency, Philip Pango, the Vice President of Tanzania. Her Excellency, Miriam Al-Mahiri, the Minister of Climate Change and Environment for the UAE. David Beasley, Executive Director for the World Food Programme. And Eric Fierwald, the CEO of Syngenta. David? And welcome, everybody. Thank you for your time. David, I want to begin with you. I think no one's ringing the alarm bell louder than you. On the short-term crisis, which I think many of us understand because we see the headlines, for me also what's crucial is what we've discussed here, which is the trajectory of where we're going without dramatic intervention. Oh, boy, Julia, you know, before Ukraine, I was already out there with a clarion yeah. call that we've got a world food crisis and we're facing the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse over a year ago, you had Ethiopia, then you had Afghanistan, and then the breadbasket of the world that's now got the longest bread lines of the world. And so now, because of this crisis, we're taking food from the hungry to give to the starving. It's absolutely a crisis mode. What do you think is going to happen when you take a nation that normally grows enough food to feed 400 million people and you sideline that? What do you think is going to happen? And so when you add the fuel costs, food costs, shipping costs, it's devastating to not just our operations, but to global food security. When you go back to 2007, 2008 in Arab Spring, you look at the economic indicators then, and you had 40 nations with political unrest, riots, protests, and today the conditions are actually worse. So look what you see in Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Peru, Pakistan, I could keep going on. That is only a sign of things to come. And so over the next 10 to 12 months, we probably will have a significant, as we are having, a pricing problem. But because of the fertilizer issues that we're facing, the lack of production, not just in Ukraine, but in North America, South America, Africa, Asia, because of droughts and many other factors, we very well could have a food availability problem that's not going to impact just the poorest or the poor, it's going to impact everybody. And that's why I'm excited to be here, because I think the media and the leaders are now beginning to recognize that we have got a problem, Houston, and we've got to zero in on the solutions. Now, it's a perfect storm within a perfect storm. And if we don't get the port of Odessa open, it's only going to compound our problems. Because we've got to get those fields back operational. We've got to get those silos full again, but they can't get the silos empty unless we get the ships flowing. It's critical, absolutely critical, because we will have famines around the world. And the number that you mentioned, when I took this job, there were 80 million people marching to starvation. That's not chronic hunger. You mentioned 810 million that are chronically hungry. These are the people that are in shock, acute food insecurity. It was 80 million, and it went to 135 right before COVID. Why? Man-made conflict? Climate. COVID comes along, boom, just shocks it up to 276 million people. Now we're looking at 325 million people in what we call IPC 345. Now here's the, the most startling fact. Out of that 276 or 325 million, there are 49 million knocking on famine's door right. in 43 countries. And those are the 43 countries we have got to be extremely concerned about that will result in famine, destabilization, and mass migration if we don't get ahead of this. And I think the danger is we try and ramp up production in the short term and we do it in an unsustainable way. So actually we exacerbate the longer term issues that are exacerbating the longer term crisis that we are already in. Um, Your Excellency, I want you to come in and talk not only about Tanzania because you represent solutions. You've talked to the UN about how we tackle this for the continent of Africa in itself. So we can talk about where Africa needs to be and how it's facilitated in that. But can you talk about at least in the short term as well, what escalating fertilizer prices, what supply chain breakages mean for your country and how it's going to exacerbate the long-term issues too, to that point. Well, uh, thank you. First, um, um, the African continent has suffered not just from the 
uh, the COVID pandemic mm -hmm. and its implications on food. Uh, we have had uh, the climate effects, uh, droughts as it has already been said, but of course bad agricultural policies as well. And uh, all these need to be addressed. So for me, uh, I think if we are to avert a global uh, world crisis, I think there are two uh, strategies that we have to follow simultaneously. One is national actions. Mm. Uh, and national actions, uh, by that I mean, first, we have to deal with the mega investments currently in agriculture. Yeah? We have to invest in irrigation. We have to invest in uh, rural roads. We have to invest in uh, uh, smart agriculture. Um, so we, we also have to deal with land allocation issues for larger uh, scale uh, cultivation. Um, but importantly for the continent, we have a youthful population. Mm. Well over 70% of our people are young people below 25, 25 and below. So we have to, we must uh, uh, strategize so that we have uh, uh, the youthful population involved in agricultural value chains throughout. And this is being done in our case in Tanzania. We are even allocating uh, land over 2,000 acres, uh, uh, subdivide them into 100 uh, acres for our youth. And we think uh, this is going to make a major difference. But critically, we have to invest in um, uh, improved seed varieties. And here is where the world has, uh, can help. We have to invest in fertilizers. Uh, if we do this, for the very short term, we can, Africa, we can turn this crisis into actual an opportunity uh, for the continent. But critically, it is important that we get global partnerships. And this is what has changed uh, in the continent recently. So IFAD, the World Bank, Sinjeta, private sector, all these are coming in with uh, solutions uh, that uh, quickly uh, turn the crisis into an opportunity. Eric, I'm going to come to you and wait for it. Um, but it's tough to invest in fertilizers, at least in the short term, when the prices are soaring. I mean, in fact, governments make tough decisions, in fact, to go the opposite way with a critical, devastating impact on crop yield that, that already struggles. Miriam, the key word for me that kept coming out there, and I was trying to count, and then I lost count, was invest. Talk to me about the UAE, because you recognize for many reasons a country that has, what, less than 5% arable land, 80 to 90% food imports, and yet you're in a far better position. Admittedly, you have far more money than, than many other countries, but it does require a program. It also requires understanding the consequences of, of your policy decisions, not just implementing broad policies, and we'll come to that. Talk Thank to me you. about your view here and what you see. Thank you so much, Julia. It's lovely to be here amongst friends, so many familiar faces, and I was just actually saying to David, every time we see each other, there's another sea on top of us, right? We've got climate, conflict, COVID, crisis. We, we want it to stop because, uh, as, as you all mentioned, the numbers are, are really going into a, a trajectory that we're not um, happy with. And so um, for me, there's a lot of things that I want to talk about. So on the innovation side, yes, absolutely. We need to look on the innovation side. It's really critical that um, we know where it is, where, where we're going. And I think this is also something you want us to, to focus on. Um, there was already a lot talked about, but I want to talk about us as also some countries who are in a better position right. and what our responsibilities are. One thing I say is let's keep markets open. Uh, the flow of food needs to keep flowing because if food does not flow, we get famine. As David very well knows, uh, uh, he's always saying, you guys need to put me out of my job. But actually, we're giving him more and more job to, to do. Um, another thing that I think we all need to think about, we're all here. And in a way, we're all somewhat to blame for where we are in some way or another. And so we have to really look at solutions and working together, partnerships. Um, something I, I was talking about in another session is, let's try and eat less meat. This is something that uh, I think would be a quick win for us to, um, to, to help in the situation we're in. Let's reduce uh, food loss and food waste. It is so important that we all think about how we're living 
because what we're doing as consumers plays a huge role. Yes, invest in innovation and technology. The UAE is doing that. Uh, we launched Food Tech Valley. Uh, that's already nearly complete in its first phase. Uh, we launched Food Tech Challenge, again, trying to get agri-technologists, innovators to come and innovate. Uh, partnerships is really important. With Sadhguru, we had him just a few days ago and Save the Soil uh, campaign, how important soil is to our food systems. I can only also urge countries in their NDCs, put more ambitious NDCs and put food systems in your NDCs. It's really, really important. Uh, Pippa Malgram actually said something. He said, if, she said, if we fix food systems, we fix world order. And I really believe in that. Um, another thing I had as well is, um, yeah, the coalitions with the Aim for Climate is something we are, we're spearheading with the United States of America. We have 170 people on board now. And all this is about creating uh, kind of vehicles to, to get countries to commit. And also other countries who don't have the uh, investments to say, you know what, we want to be on board, we want to learn from you, we want to use the science, what seeds should be, we be using, what methodologies should, should we be using. And this morning mm -hmm. we signed with the World Economic Forum, the uh, Mohammed bin Rashid Global in in Innovation um, or Initiatives signed with WEF uh, to set up its, uh, an ecosystem, a global ecosystem for food innovation hubs, uh, as His Excellency also mentioned. So, all these countries or all these initiatives are coming together to create that ecosystem so that investors and investments can flow into this to accelerate um, innovation uh, enhancement. I mean, there's so much in there. I'll, I'll add one more thing. Fix food security, fix world order, inadvertently but directly tackle climate change. And I know that's going to be incredibly important to you as that's in right. COP28, and we'll come back to that. Before I get to Eric, last but not least, I just want to ask the audience, who likes to eat organic food? Who purposely, and admittedly I'm talking to 0.01% here, but who likes organic food? Be honest, please. <laughs> Participation, always welcome. Yeah, sure. a lot of you. We like organic food. <laughs> um, tough audience, Eric. Because you've been right out there and said, organic food's great. It's not the way to feed the world. You've also, as a company, come under severe fire. And it goes back to what I said at the beginning. There's a war in Ukraine, but there's a, a wider war going on. And when I look at what you're doing, I see you fighting a wider war, but that comes at a, a heavy cost for a business and for PR for that business. Talk to me about what you're doing and what you think we need to be tackling longer term too. So I think it's really important as we talk about solutions right. to start with what is the problem? and talk about we've got a major food security crisis globally, and we've got a major climate change crisis. Right. And the climate change crisis is part of the reason for the food crisis, in addition to conflict and other issues. So we've got these two major global issues that we have to tackle. Agriculture has to be part of the solution to climate change and has to tackle food security. So if we're gonna go after these, we need many solutions short-term, medium-term, and long-term. So I'm not trying to talk negative about organic or positive about organic. I'm talking about what do we need to do to, have, to meet outcome goals, to, to make sure there's enough food for everybody in the world, that agriculture is more productive, we can grow more food on less land. And if we can do that, and at the same time, the, the same practices, the same technologies that do that, help address and solve climate change. Take agriculture from 12% of greenhouse gases, ag food system from a third, to nature positive. How do we do both? And so I talk about things like regenerative agriculture practices, which food companies are increasingly talking about, governments are increasingly talking about, banks. How can we help farmers do things like don't till the soil, leave the carbon in the soil. Don't take away the stove or don't burn the stove or leave the carbon in the soil. Uh, cover, cover crops in the winter so that you don't have soil erosion. Puts more carbon in the soil. Rotate crops so that you have more nutrition going into the soil. These types of practices and the technologies that enable them are the solutions. Let's talk about solutions, not just, not, not just preconceived notions about what they should be. What are the facts? What's the data? How are these things doing? We've worked with 1,600 demonstration farms with these types of practices and have seen dramatic yield increases after several years, 33% reduction in greenhouse gases, 
far less fertilizer and pesticides. And, and that, that's better for the soil, better for food security, and deals with climate change. I want to go back on your point there, though, because, um, you know, it goes back to the point of policy and understanding where your destination is. I mean, you said it's not against organic or not, and it's great for your margins because you make better margins. The, product, the problem is the yields are lower. Yes. Um, and <laughs> if you look at the Green Deal in the EU, they're now mandating 25% organic. So a policymakers coming up with bold ideas that sound really good, but actually come at the cost of perhaps famine in other parts of the world. That's the consequence of some policy decisions, like organic farming, for example. It's like we have to work out where we're going and then work backwards. Right, so we and, and, and our industry are encouraging the EU for, in, the, in the farm to fork strategy to have outcome goals. Right. To have goals around productivity, land productivity, agriculture productivity, and greenhouse gas reductions per unit of, of food production. Then that will unleash technologies and practices that make that happen. And if organic can be improved in order, and achieve those goals, fantastic. What I, what I see happening, the reality, because I talk to a lot of farmers and, and spend a lot of time in, in, on farms, is that if you take the best from organic, the, the, the rotation of crops, and the best from conventional, where, where you, 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 you use limited, only way you need fertilizer and crop protection, but you also go beyond that with these other practices and technologies that enable them, you can dramatically increase the yields and you can drop the greenhouse gas emissions dramatically. Would you like to come in here and talk about what this would mean, this kind of science, this kind of specific targeting, this data analysis of understanding farming would mean for a continent like Africa, for example? Well, that, that, that's key. Uh, for example, we have uh, initiatives right now where we deal with um, acidity of the soil, yes. uh, uh, salinity, salinity, and this make a lot of difference because you are dealing with uh, climate-related issues, but again, you are also uh, making a big uh, impact on agricultural productivity. So. Uh, I think these are just some of the initiatives that we need to uh, scale up. Uh, but aside from that, in the case of the African continent, I think there is another dimension that uh, is often sidelined. We are all focusing on Ukraine, that terrible war, unwarranted. But we have similar uh, challenges across the continent. In Mozambique, Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, South Sudan, Central African Republic, and therefore, there has to be regional uh, interventions, regional collaboration to resolve uh, these conflicts as well. Otherwise, uh, no, whatever the science you are going to apply to improve agricultural productivity, if we don't silence the guns, uh, it's not going to work. So we have to deal with both. Yeah, I mean, that's such a vital point, and we, we can't escape that. Whatever we talk about in terms of gene editing or science or agri-tech, when it comes to the possibility at some point in the future of the continent of Africa not being a net importer, actually being a net exporter and providing incomes for the farming households. I mean, that, that's a dream, but it's, to your point, it takes more than just perhaps science. Um, Miriam, can you come in on this point? Sure, please? sure. Whether it's strategic plans ahead of, of COP28 or, or more targeting, because every, every area is different. Uh, tailored responses yeah. are required to that point specifically, wherever it's, you are in the world. It's so difficult because now we're all sort of looking at what's happening in the news and it's kind of swaying us a little bit away from all the things we were discussing before. I mean, again, climate crisis, food crisis. Friends, it's right outside that door. And the danger and, is short-term solutions yeah. to address exactly. the supply crisis exactly. and it pushes us in the wrong direction in every other way. Yeah, and the complexity is that everyone is at a different level, everyone has different resources, and everything is kind of interlinked together. Food systems contribute to a third of global greenhouse gases. Food systems are a problem, but they're also a solution. Uh, we've got, because of the conflict, all the humanitarian work that needs to be done, all the, the focus areas that needs to be swayed so that we get the people that are actually in need of food, um, that they get to the food, that they get the access of food. 
that those who want to go into more sustainable methods of farming can get access to finance. It's really, really complex. And um, there's no, uh, how do you say, a, a solution or, or a silver lining to, to do this. But what we can say is that by working together, we're much stronger. And I also feel that going to now towards COP27 in Egypt and then COP28 in the UAE, we'll, we're really looking to uh, make sure we have the inclusivity element in it, that we're looking across the whole food supply chain, not only looking on the production side, but as I said, also on the consumer side, this, we all have a role to play in this. Um, we want to make sure that we have solutions that we can scale up. It's so important because solutions are there, but we really have to scale up, knowing that we also are going to be needing 50% more food by 2050 is also a scary uh, thought because not only do we have the pressures that we have now today, but also thinking of the future moving ahead. Um, and I can just say that we just need to make sure that leaders are seeing the food crisis as it, it needs to be a priority for everyone. And as a punchline, I just want to say that solving the global food crisis is everyone's business. Everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's smart business. Please. <laughs> and David, you've got a great statistic, and that is, I think, what Germany and other nations learned during the Syrian war, which was the price it takes to feed a person who wants to stay in their own country despite the challenges relative to the cost of providing food, support, whatever it is in a, in a country like Germany. And you can quote me, I don't want to misquote you, but I think the difference was 50 cents in Syria versus $70 a day in Germany. It's smart business sense above everything. It's sensible policy. Mm. Did I get the stat right? I thought you were going to come in there and correct me. <laughs> <laughs> you get it right. But the only add to that is it, it, it's it's less. It's about seven cents per per person if they if we teach them to farm. Oh, and that's the other thing. Not just to feed yourselves too, but to feed others as well. It can be a an income generating um, project rather than just feeding yourself. Absolutely. Eric, on that point, China. What can we learn from China? I believe seventy five percent now of agricultural patents for things like gene editing to try and protect against crop wastage, viruses, whatever it is, are coming from China. And this is a country that knows it's got a lot of people to feed and more people to feed in the future. Yeah, I think China agriculture is transforming rapidly. And they're doing it by government working together with companies to support farmers, but not just farmers, going all the way to the food companies and the consumers with sustainability data. What's, what's amazing now in, in China we have these map centers, which multiple companies support farmers with everything the farmer needs. So uh, with a 60 kilometer radius, the farmer gets their soil sampled, gets taught regenerative techniques, gets their seed, everything they need, the financing. Then they get higher quality, sustainably grown foods. And, and, and the blockchain goes all the way to the consumer who can scan the final product and see a picture of the farmer who grew their product and the sustainability data, how much greener that product is. And I think the, the learning for me there is government working together with industry to support not only farmers, but the whole value chain all the way to the consumer, and then consumers wanting sustainably grown healthy foods. It works in a command economy. Does it work in um, other countries? It has to. Okay. So I, I took this role at Syngenta six years ago and I would say we had no collaborations with any NGOs. And I would say I would spend maybe 2% of my time with other companies through the value chain. Now we collaborate across the whole value chain, the ag input companies with the grain companies, the processors, the food companies, the retailers, NGOs, government officials, World Food Program. Uh, you know, we're, we're all in, we, we know that we're all in this together and we have to collaborate. So the answer is yes, we have to do it. We have no choice. It's the only way we solve food crisis and climate crisis. You presented to the United Nations and said, look, we're ready. ECOWAS countries, we're ready to invest. We just need the money. We need financing, we need support, we need to be listened to so you understand, to your point about the challenges of conflict. There are many complexities, but if you provide people with the money that they can do more than just provide food for their families, they could perhaps sell some of that food and provide income, you would transform 
some of the 30 million farming households across the African continent. What was the response when you went to the UN and said, hey, show me the money? Well, the, the, the response was uh, uh, good in some cases, uh, but in others... I feel like you're being a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, we, as Africa, we would want more. Uh, we have had uh, support from uh, the World Bank, the African Development Bank uh, in particular, uh, coming up with the finances that we need uh, to invest in the range of uh, uh, measures that, we are, that are being di uh, discussed here. So, for example, we will have to invest uh, in uh, making sure that we minimize uh, post-harvest losses. Right. We, 30 to 40 percent, to yeah. be clear, across the African continent. This is each harvest. So we, we, need, uh, we need resources to invest in uh, uh, warehousing of uh, uh, the crops that are produced. And I can tell the audience that Africa has the capacity to actually produce surplus for the, for the world. And, the, and this is such an important point. Africa could be a net exporter to the world. David, what difference no. would that make? No, Africa can feed the entire world, clearly, but there's, what's the problem? There's many. There, there's been a lot of money poured into Africa in the last two, three, four decades, and we're just not making the progress we need to make. And I think from the World Bank to IFIs and as well as donor nations have got to be more strategic and effective with how we move into nations that need to improve productivity, et cetera, from transparency, rule of law, and a list of many, many other things. I know we've changed how we do a lot of things in Africa. We no longer just bring food in Africa. We now buy a lot inside Africa, trying to stimulate local markets. We do now cash-based transfers, uh, literally a couple billion dollars inside Africa, and we're doing everything we can to teach. And I, I can tell you, for every beneficiary I've ever met, I've never met a beneficiary that wanted a handout. They want to be able to take care of their own families, their own villages, their own communities. And you want to talk about entrepreneurship? Talk to an African woman out there in the village. Oh, my gosh. It, it's unbelievable. I, I, I can show you video after video. Me talking with, like, Biba and these other women, like <laughs> Mr. Beasley, you came in here and you gave us a water well so that we can now fish ourselves. Yeah. And she, and she said... She said, I'm no longer feeding just my family. I'm now feeding the village, selling into the marketplace. We're buying clothes. We're buying medicines. And now I'm paying for my son's wedding. And she said it with such pride. She says, if I can get five more acres. I mean, that's the thinking when the difference between handing out food and giving a tremendous way and opportunity. And so the donor nations have got to rethink. Just you've you got to give us the tools to scale up. Yeah. and achieve this success because the entrepreneurial spirit is just as strong in Africa as it is in any developed nation around the world. Clearly, and I can tell you, the World Food Program will never end hunger. The United Nations will never end hunger until the private sector is front and center and engaged with leaders around the world. You're never going to end poverty and hunger. Are you engaged enough as a business community? I know you are, but the business community. We have to be engaged more. I mean, we've got to solve this. But let me give you one example. So the World Food Program has put together something called the Farm to Market Alliance in East Africa. And so it's, it's Yara, it's Bayer, Agra, um, Rabobank, and Syngenta trying to work together to figure, figure this out with farmer solution centers right. in, in a number of countries, including Tanzania and Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Zambia. And, and, and we're learning a lot, but we've got to do better. But, but the fact that we're coming together what we, what we figured out what we need to do, though, is we're willing to come together and work together, but we have to connect to the demand downstream, and we have to get stronger government connections. Right. So all of that has to come together. So we need some examples of that happening and success, and then we'll get there. Okay, I'm energized. Miriam, 18 months. Um, yes. We'll come back very briefly at the end to the short, short, short term. <laughs> but you have 18 months. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be going to any COP without talking about food security, quite frankly, oh, given, as we've said, the two things are inextricably linked. What's the game plan? Give me five bullets or however many you want to give me. But 
the okay. pressure's on. Okay. Because we need to come out of COP28, COP27, fine too, but yes. you know, you're key for this. Um, the same way as we did last year, like deals, signing, agreements, the business community, supernatural bodies. We, we can make huge strides, but we need a game plan. Yeah. So Give me the vision, 18 months out. Okay, so COP26, most countries put out when they want to reach net zero, but that's quite far ahead. Yeah. far into the future. Yeah, but it's only, it's only, what, nine harvests? So if I think about that in terms of food security, I'm already like jumping up and down in my seat. Sorry to interrupt. No problem. Okay. Um, so what's really important is that we need to ensure that, first of all, as I said, innovation. Right. And a lot of initiatives have happened. And even just today, all the meetings I've had, there's so many new initiatives happening where people want to collaborate and really push forward the innovation. Like I said, the NDCs, making sure that countries are now putting more ambitious targets because innovation has just gone so far and those who have already submitted their NDCs, I'm sure they're a lot further on, they can put more ambitious targets, including food systems in the NDCs. Yeah. We're gonna have, definitely at COP28, food systems is gonna have as much weight as the energy conversation is gonna have because it's something that's touching us all and we need to make sure that this is getting the attention that it, it deserves. Um, also, making sure we have the inclusivity part. We need to make sure we're taking all stakeholders from smallholder farmers, youth, women, that they're all part of this conversation. I know we're a country, it's an oil and gas country. Again, this is very unique about COP28. We've got the global stock, first global stock take. Uh, we're an oil and gas uh, country, but we're serious about this. We're serious about this, we're here. We know that within our journey that we've already taken on the, on the energy sector, we're not perfect, but we at least have a vision, we have an aim, and we wanna make sure that we are part of the conversations as global responsible citizens in this conversation. And there's, there's no time. We can't let perfection get in the way of action, quite frankly. Um, we have one and a half minutes left. So David, the challenge is on. Um, I, I mentioned I wanna bring it back to the short term and I want to talk about the alarm bells, that the, the focus, um, yes, he was a keynote speaker and, and did not want to participate. So we're, I, my apologize. I know. Um, again, at some point in the future, I promise. You're in demand, Your Excellency. Um, we have one and a half minutes. So I do want to go to David on the immediate crisis. <laughs> You've said open the ports. We need to find a solution to open the ports and let the supply out. We didn't talk about Russia too, but we can't sustain our food system without fertilizer from Russia. That's a basic fact. And we need to acknowledge that, I think. And, and globally, we need to acknowledge that. And crops that. from Russia. I, and crops, I agree. And I think people don't understand the implications of sanctions, which I think is important too. We have to look at the consequences of all of them. Um, but David, I think what we're looking at here, and, and we can debate how you open those food corridors, how you get that grain out, but we need to do it. And there will be global consequences if we don't. But I think, what we perhaps have to say is, um, whatever Putin, Vladimir Putin's legacy is and hopes to be, he's potentially threatening famine, global famine around the world. How about that for a legacy? Does that need to be the short-term message that we present today? Failure to open up the ports is a declaration of war on global food security. Right. It's that, it's that simple. Uh, if we can get the ports open, it doesn't solve the problem, but it begins to create stability of a volatile food market right now, combined with all these other issues that we're facing, which we could talk about all day long. And so every 1% increase in hunger, there's a 2% increase in migration. Just think about that for a minute. And we just gave some numbers. We've gone from 80 million to now 323 million people marching towards starvation. So I was doing the math. Break down, down to which countries? African countries, Asian countries, Middle East countries. And I tell my friends in Europe, you don't need to be concerned only what's happening to the east of you. You need to understand what's going to be happening to the south and to the southeast of you if you don't rein in this global food security problem. And if you think you're having a problem now with a, nation, with a world of 7.7 .7 billion people, and we're struggling now to feed everyone, which is absolutely horrendous. Imagine what's going to happen when we have 10 billion people, 12 billion people, and climate impact is only going to increase. And what breaks your heart, there's $430 trillion worth of wealth on planet Earth today. There should not be a single child on this planet 
that goes to bed hungry, much less starve to death. And there are enough leaders in Davos this week to end hunger, not just by charity. Yes, that's important in a very singular crisis we're having right now. But long term, we need their engagement, their ingenuity, their creativity. That is what the world needs at a time like this. The rallying cry doesn't get stronger. And by the way, David, to, to the earlier point, we don't want to put you out of business. We just want you to be the last line of defense, not the first. <laughs> and that's the challenge too. your panel. Thank you. Thank you.